Welcome back to one more episode of Slaves the Algo. We continue with Lucia, founder and CEO of Emerge. Lucia has had a fascinating career that started at the age of eight. I thought it was 12, but she corrected me and told me it was eight, where she learned about what she wanted to do in her life and create social impact. And then that went on to her starting to get into the world of technology. And she's become one of the leading social tech entrepreneurs in the world. In the last episode, we talked with Lucy a lot about data and identity and privacy and how different kinds of applications are being used to create social impact. In this episode, we're going to continue the conversation with her on how data and AI is being used to help migrant workers, solve corruption problems, and so on. Welcome back to the show, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Um, I am super happy to be here and keep keep this discussion going. Lucy, I think... Uh, a lot of the work that you do is with migrant workers and, and refugees. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, 80 million people see their homes, nearly 25 million plus refugees. Mm -hmm. Most of them are under the age of 18, which is not just a refugee problem. It's a problem in terms of uh, sexual abuse. It's a problem in terms of economics, etc. Many of them deny nationality, lack access to basic rights. Uh, and now AI and machine learning and data are being used to understand migration related phenomena right mm -hmm. project jetson which has this index that you know allows you to make short term predictions of data flow you worked a lot to the migrant migrant uh, caravans in, in mexico and all of that mm -hmm. what sort of data are you using are you seeing being used to help the whole cause of refugees and migrants Sure. Um, so actually that 80 million is an interesting figure because it's what what does the United Nations recognize as a displaced person? And that 80 million is a statistic that relates to conflict, conflict based uh, displacement. So unfortunately, that means that anyone that is fleeing due to climate, due to economic factors, uh, they they don't count in that statistic. Um, mm -hmm. And then it also doesn't count homeless people, which is a very interesting form of displacement because it generally tends to be the longest term uh, form of displacement. And so to me, it's one of those things where I just uh, there's I think every single person on the planet has an issue that they think about at night. Like they just it's an issue that like whether it's, you know, many uh, parents, for example, think about education or issues that relate to children. I think that some people think about, you know, what the state of the world is looking like in terms of climate. I think that, I think the most, like the average good person in the world thinks about an issue regularly. And for me, I cannot sleep when I start thinking about displacement and the consequences of displacement and the causes of displacement. It just becomes like a whole uh, huge snowball that I just, it impacts my ability to sleep because I'm just very uh, saddened that, that this is the state of the world and that people are living in this condition. And so it's been an issue that I just care very deeply about. And um, to me, there was, you know, we were looking at what, what data is collected on refugees is it, it's it's interesting because there's a lot of misconceptions about it like there not being a lot of data on them but actually uh in order to be resettled uh it's actually one of the most robust files that you'll ever see on a person like you the the burden of proof for resettlement you can you need like documentation that like a normal person wouldn't even think to keep in order wow. like it's like it, the, the amount of security checks background checks verifications uh testimonies etc 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 like it's actually a quite bureaucratic process and so on average it takes about one that's, to two years that's very to resettle interesting because i thought the one thing that people wanting to be resettled wouldn't have is data yeah except that because in order for them to like for countries to say yeah we'll take them but we want to know everything about them because otherwise we don't want to let them in right so then what happens is like on average it takes one to two years to get someone resettled but this is also like benevolent policy right so benevolent policy is making it so that certain countries decide we're going to open up X amount of slots for displaced persons in, you know, to come to X country. Canada is a very generous example. They said, you know, uh, at the onset of um, Syrian crisis, they said, we're going to take in 75,000 Syrian refugees in the span of three months. That was a very generous example. Uh, but that means that like 75,000 out of 80 million on conflict alone. And so, and they're one of the most generous countries in relation mm -hmm. to this. And so really what you're looking at is that on an annual basis, about 104, 105,000 people get resettled a year. That's it. That's it. Because the, that's it. 
because it's a very burdensome process. It takes on average one to two years. And because it depends on countries that are saying, yes, we will accept refugees. Now, the problem with this is that it creates a burden narrative and public opinion actually makes things worse because then people are saying, well, they are a burden, right? Because they're, you know, we're going to have to pay for them to come and then they're going to have to adapt and maybe they learn the language and so on and so forth. So there's a very big uh, public opinion that is formed on the basis of the fact that we're treating these people like they're, they are a burden. And in reality, especially when it comes to conflict, conflict affects everyone. Conflict does not discriminate. A bomb does not choose only to impact the world's most poor. A bomb will hit wherever. It'll it hit impact doctors. It'll impact engineers. It'll impact other like graphic designers, mechanics. It will impact, you know, people with no education and it will leave people in very, you know, dire, dire circumstances, but conflict does not discriminate. And so when you think about it, we're only collecting data that relates to this idea of like, okay, who are you? Why are you displaced? Are you actually who you say you are? Are you a threat to some kind of national security? Do you have any family members anywhere else in the world that maybe we can send you to if you pass all these security clearances? Um, all of these things are conducive to this idea that like they're never going to add value to a society. But in actuality, when you look at like the the value of you know people that have different types of skill sets, of people that have different types of culture that that really bring vibrancy to a city, especially in in the case of knowing that like it's a young population that's being displaced. And you have so many countries like Scandinavian countries, for example, or even Canada that are aging populations. The, the people in those countries aren't having kids as fast. And so when you think about even like something as simple as an, an economic to be on capitalistic terms as pension funds, pension funds yep. are structured very oddly because the what you think you're doing is that you're paying to a pension fund and eventually you're going to retire and that's the money that you're going to get. That's not true. You're paying your pension fund. And then like if that pension fund is paying for somebody else that's retired right now. And then eventually the next generation is going to put money into their pension fund. And that's, what's going to fund I know. you. So when you would you call it a Ponzi aging... scheme in other places, but yeah, exactly. I mean... your words, your words. <laughs> but the, the problem with that is like, if you have an eight, a country with an aging population, who's putting money into their pension funds because you have mostly people living off their pension funds. So even economically speaking, it makes a lot of sense to bring in young populations into countries with aging populations to make sure your economics work out. <laughs> so there's like many reasons, obviously. I, that's a, an example for a, a heavily capitalistic outlook on life. But I think- uh, But because when it comes to the actual migrant and the refugee, right? I mean, they're seeking- yeah. But we didn't know they have anything to have about documentation. Them. They need financial services. They need to send money back home. There's a whole bunch of different things. How are you seeing social entrepreneurs make an impact on the actual refugee well, or migrant worker? Two. There's two situations there because what you just described of them needing financial services, et cetera, that's because they're currently in a state of, of refugee and they need services now because they don't have access to a lot of things now, especially like there are some refugee camps in Africa where they're not allowed to have a phone because that could like, basically they don't want to risk uh, giving them the types of rights and, and uh, uh, opportunities that regular residents have, because then the UN can turn around and say like, oh, well, now you've just accepted that this person lives in your country. So tr like countries that are transitory, like, you know, when people flee into Jordan or flee into Uganda or flee, flee into whatever, they have to deal with the fallout, but they can't accept everybody, obviously. And so uh, so then it becomes problematic. So the, the first issue is what do they need right now? But the second issue, which is the one I focus more on, is how do we get them out of that situation as fast as possible? And to me, the fact that the type of data that we have only captures burden is a very big problem. So if my priority is like lo looking at data that would bring dignity back to this process. Like, who are you? Like, did you ever get an education? And if so, what did you train in? Or what is your job experience? What is it that you uh, prioritize in terms of like cultural connection or, uh, or economic opportunity? For example, you know, someone that's been torn away from their home you know, they might prioritize a, a cultural community because they never wanted to leave in the first place. So, you know, uh, the, the U.S. is a very good example of this because I know the, ge the geography of it. But if, for example, you have a, uh, you know, a Mormon, um, you wouldn't send them to San Francisco because they wouldn't, they would struggle to find a Mormon church in San Francisco, perhaps. But if you sent them to a place where there's a very big Mormon community, they might feel a little bit more connected and it might be a little easier for them to resettle. But if you yep. have someone that just cares about labor, then like what cities are fastly, you know, hiring, growing their economies, like, you know, Miami, for example, might be a good choice right now. 
And so you start to learn more about who they are as people. And then that data allows you to resettle them in places where they will be value add. And it's no longer a burden narrative, but actually very much a value add narrative, which is what they are. And so uh, so there's two, two, two of these questions. There's men, much work uh, that's being done on the realm of getting them what they need now. So a lot of uh, education initiatives to, to help upskill uh, refugees, have them learn about coding, have them learn about UX, UI and things like that at refugee camps to prepare them for uh, for the future of work. So I think that's been a very interesting use case. Obviously, there's like some peer-to-peer uh, payments and um, a company called Sempo that's doing like emergency relief uh, via, via digital currencies. So there's a lot of work that's being done on the let's get them what they need now. But my question is like, how fast can we get them out of that situation? Because they shouldn't be living in that situation. You don't want 52% of refugees right now are under the age of 18, and you do not want them growing up in a situation where they don't have official rights, official home, official connection into, into modern day society, because that's a problem that you're leaving to your children. It means that people will not be able to integrate properly and that they're growing up outside understandings of law, of education sectors, of health access. And, and we need to solve that. And so I, like, the more it's almost like the more that services that we give them to deal with the, where they are now in terms of camps and things like that, the more it becomes worrisome to me that we're going to use that as like an excuse to keep them there for longer. And I want to make sure that we're pulling them out of camp situations, that we're resettling them around the world, that we're you know strengthening communities and economies around the world by allowing people to, to move freely throughout the world. And I think that's where data can have like data can shape not just the way that we do this efficiently, but it can also shape the narratives around which people are more receptive to, to this out outcome as well. So that's really what my priority is. And, 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 and that's fantastic because what you're talking about is two different problems. One is the fact that you need to make these people, you need to settle these people in some form from their skills, from their homes, from their identity, from their communities. And the second part, but you also worked on this and this is something I'm curious about, um, which is, you know, I mean, remittances and sending money home for all migrant workers, whether you're in, in a country or outside, is a huge part of why people leave. You know, the economic refugee leaves mm -hmm. because they don't have an economic future in the country. They go somewhere else and they're really sending the money back home. And you had some really interesting experiences with uh, using um, Bitcoin to really break the, the kind of... Um, the stranglehold that the existing financial payment networks have and the amount of money that they're charging. Could you share us a little bit more about how uh, tech is being used to solve, um, to make sure that if I earn $100, most of the $100 goes back home? Yeah, yes. Um, so a very fun fact that I think few people know about me is that in, I think it was 2017, yeah, or 18, I can't remember, but um, essentially I lived as an undocumented person for three months. Um, I essentially what I wanted to understand was like, what, where are the invisible barriers? Like, I know, logically speaking, you don't have an ID, you can't open a bank account, you can't get a job, you can't like, I know, you know, everybody knows more or less like what those primary pain points are, but I wanted to know what are the invisible barriers? And one of the invisible barriers that I found that I was sort of kind of screwed by, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but, um, was this the, the the fact that like within the first like by the first month I'd run out of money like I I didn't have money anymore and so I texted my mom and I was like hey mom you know can you send me a little bit of money on uh, uh through Western Union and so she sent me money on Western Union but she sent me there's like apparently a limit there's like a, a cash limit and so if you send anyone even like 10 cents more than that limit instead of giving you cash, they'll give you a check. And that means you have to find a place to go get it checked, wow. like to go get it cash. And unfortunately, my mom sent me the right amount. It would have been below, but the but conversion rate. It. Absolutely. I figured yes. this out. I wouldn't be yes. surprised if it was a deliberate thing. Uh, well, you know, so uh, they gave me a check. And so I was holding onto this check, but I didn't have ID and I didn't have anything. I didn't have a bank account. So how was I going to cash this check? And ultimately, uh, I I had to go and get a like a, an under the table job, get paid in cash that weekend because I was holding on to this check that I could not cash. And so I 
I never did. Ultimately, like I cashed it three, like two months later when I finished this three month uh, experiment. And so uh, it sounds weird to say it, uh, call it an experiment because it's very privileged of me to, to be able to do that. But it really did give me so much insight into understanding like, what are the ways in which life is made so much more difficult by virtue of, you know, the way that you experience identity, the way that you experience money. And, you know, Bitcoin is a very interesting <laughs> experiment because what it does is it allows you to, to trade more directly without the need of middlemen, except that that's theoretically true, but it's currently not true because you're still using wallets and you're still using yeah. exchanges and you're still using a lot of different types of services. Um, and the reason for that is because it hasn't been widely adopted enough uh, to be able to be a direct form of payment. And so to me, Bitcoin represents a very future, uh, a very big future opportunity for us to be able to send payments cheaper, faster, instantly, immutably, trustedly. So, you know, if you are a person that is working in, uh, you know, as a farmer in the U.S., that's sending money back to your family members in El Salvador, that let's say you, you are sending this money to pay for your children's school, that there is a way, thanks to the Bitcoin blockchain, that you could trace the money all the way to the school. Because you know that that's where the money's yep. going. But for that to happen, then, you know, the school needs to be able to accept Bitcoin as currency. And so, so the more that and we then sort you of... Need somewhere, somewhere along the way, this is going to... And this is the one of the things I'm having, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead of your answer no here. Every country will have to have a CBDC of some sort. Uh... That comes with its own challenges. Because otherwise, how are we going to be able to track all of these things without having some kind of central authority in a decent well, model? Well, why you don't need a central authority to trace my money, like my money, my freedom. So no, <laughs> but the but I think like the government will want to uh, to trace it, but that doesn't mean I have to use it. And I think that that's really what what the underlying principle of, of Bitcoin is, right? Is this idea that like the, it's a separation of money and the state. Because the state does should not be privy to all of my financial transactions. It should be privy to the financial transactions that are relevant. So I do think that you know there is room in the world for different types of cryptocurrencies, including stable coins and CBDCs or whatever. But I think it's up to individual sovereignty to decide which financial instrument you're going to use to transfer money. And so personally, I would transfer using Bitcoin. Um, but that immutability of saying, okay, I'm sending my family member money to pay, you know, for school, that I should be able to sort of see the full thread of that happen. And that's what Bitcoin enables that I think the trust level uh, is, is increased when it comes to sending remittances, because obviously, like, as the person that's in the US working, I, once I send the money via Western Union or whatever, I don't really control, like, I hope that whoever's receiving it is using it in the right ways. And sometimes they're not. Um, you know, and so I think that there's a really uh, big value add of the trust and, and traceability of that. But I think even just by like, you, you see so many countries that are exploring making Bitcoin legal tender, you see more merchants willing to accept it uh, every day. And so I think that like, that's going to be a very important milestone. It's going to be when you don't need to transform your Bitcoin into a, a fiat currency, like a dollar or a you know local currency, when you, that no longer becomes imperative for you to do in order for you to use that money, I think at that point, we're going to hit a very uh, interesting point in uh, the remittance market because it's going to change the way that money is sent. And I Absolutely. think that- you know, com companies that struggle to adapt, like Western Union, or like you know, they they have been experimenting with uh, with blockchain rails, but I think that it's not sufficient once true competition from completely decentralized currency comes into play. That said, Absolutely. you know, it'll be very think, interesting to see how governments design gonna, CBDCs. Don't, don't accordingly. I think it's going to lead to a different set of, set of challenges because I understand that it's my money and I should be able to send it anywhere. I don't want the state to know. But at the same time, when you look at what is happening around the world at the moment of money and corruption mm -hmm. and so on, states do want to know and have, want to have some kind of a right to be able to say, I'll try and control it. So just like between data and privacy, I think we're going to have a little bit of this. When you have the completely decentralized model is, what is the traceability of it beyond you know, for when things are being used with bad intentions, but that's probably yeah, but a, I think a actually, trust in itself. I do have an answer. Well, like the the answer here is like because we're used to thinking about people instead of money. So, like the thing is that you know when you see an, a corrupt actor, a criminal, or whatever, what the way that they investigate this is they investigate the person. 
right? So they say, hey, I'm, I have a suspicion about X person and like, you know, we're going to investigate this person and where they're receiving money from and so on and so forth. So the entirety of the burden of like investigative, you know, need is done toward the person. When it comes to using networks like Bitcoin or things like that, you're not, in, you're not investigating the person because you don't know who the person is. Maybe, maybe you do. You can piece it together, but like, uh, for the most part, if they've, you know, handled their transactions all wrong. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you know, you're not looking at the person, you're looking at the money. And I think that that's actually a really interesting thing because we like to say innocent until proven guilty. And that's because we're looking at people and we're saying you, I think, are you know guilty of a crime. The, the law will treat you innocent until proven guilty, but we're looking at you for committing a crime. Whereas this new approach of like, traceable money, immutably traceable money is saying, hey, there's evidence here that money is being used in the wrong way. Let's figure out who's responsible for this. And so it works in reverse. And it's going to uh, it's going to require a change in attitude, uh, to, like a, in perception of all regulators, authorities, even people to understand that now you have evidence and you need to figure out who the wallet addresses belong to. And that is possible uh, in, in, in most cases. It's very, very possible. Uh, but what you're, well, the point of departure now is actually you have evidence of wrongdoing because you've traced that money uh, and you, it, you know, that's really what you're, what you're um, basing your, your claims against. And I love the way you described it, that it is going to need a different attitude because we want to focus on the data flow and the money flow rather than the people. However, and I do admit to some ideological challenges with what you're saying, because I do believe that there are a lot of people with truly bad intentions. So you have to have a system that's also able to look at, you know, from a people perspective. But that's probably a discussion another day, because yeah. I need to get on to another aspect of your life. It's a multidimensional life, clearly, which is the fact that you are one of the leading women in tech. And you have a perspective on the fact that there are too many male people, especially even in, even in blockchain. I mean, it's full of men. I mean, everywhere I go, there's only men that I see, including myself, right? So why is there, uh, what, what, what can we do? I mean, is, is there this huge gender diversity gap? You know, how can you encourage women in tech to play a more active part in this industry? And, and I ask you this question from a different perspective. It's been proven in country after country that when you do direct transfers of money into women's wallets, you know, it's, it's happened in India that when you actually go and give food and this thing and whatever it is to women, they are far more responsible with this whole idea of money and family and long-term thinking. But somehow that doesn't seem to come into the tech industry. So what's your take on this thing? Why do we not have more women saying we will change the world through tech? Uh, to be clear and fair, I don't think there are too many men in tech. I just think there aren't enough women in tech. That's, um, that's the, fair uh, point. the that's caveat, right. yeah. Uh, we, we need more people in tech, really, is what I'm saying. Um, the And this, I think it leads to my answer, the second part of my answer. The first part of my answer is you're right about the statistics around uh, giving people uh, money and opportunity, women money and opportunity. Um, no matter where you look, whatever country you're looking at in the world, including countries that are perceived to be high, uh, like gender equal, Scandinavian countries primarily, um, no matter where you look, including Scandinavian countries, women are the primary decision makers of a household. And that includes household spending in even decisions now that traditionally and historically have been male. So like cars are still today currently being primarily decided by women. And so about 79% of households- I didn't know that. Yeah, like before- I thought it was a it was guy like thing. A yeah, like a typical man decision, which was what car the family is going to have, is now women, being made by women. And so, and not only that, but also they are 51% of the world's population. So there's more women, which means that if you're looking at the next wealth transfer that's going to happen, number one, it's going to be the largest wealth transfer we've ever seen in the history of humanity. And number two, it's going to fall primarily in the hands of women. And so if you are a company that is not seriously considering the impact of your product, service, platform, whatever, data on women, you are very, very, very uh, blind to what is the future reality of gender dynamics in the world. And so I think, number one, it's really important that strategically companies start to pay more attention into the blind biases and the subconscious biases that they have in their product, services, and platforms and start understanding more what the gender impacts are of their, their existence as a company, because that'll be very necessary for their future survival. The second thing is that 
like we need to make sure that women know that there are many ways to enter the tech sector. And it doesn't just mean being a programmer. I love women programmers. I love seeing women programmers. Statistically speaking, they are much more uh, detail oriented and error free than male programmers. Uh, just saying, been, but uh, I'm not a programmer. So I take that but it is not, well, you know, statistically, like there's been some, some gender bl uh, blind studies and women generally tend to make fewer errors. Um, but, uh, but that's not the only way you can contribute to the tech sector. Right now, the tech sector, oh my God, AI and blockchain desperately need communicators uh, because people are really struggling to, to like assuage fears of, you know, how people feel about these technologies. People are trying to communicate what the value propositions are in ways that people can understand. It's very hard to do. Um, you know, you need communicators. You need people that have an understanding of operations. Like I, I remember one time I said something like, uh, I want my operation teams to be all like women that have had children in the last like five years. And everyone was looking at me like, what? And I was like, yeah, I want like women that have been moms for like, like five years. That's going to be my operations team because no one understands like proper, like routine operation, detail oriented, like they do. And so I think like saying, okay, I want more women in my operations team, more women in my communications team. I want more women in my design team because we need the perspective of their lived experience to know how to properly design our product. These are all easy ways that you can start getting involved in the tech sector. And that's how I started. I didn't program when I first started. I mean, I still would say I'm really bad at it, but um but the, the, now it's lack of practice and discipline because I'm building other stuff. But uh, I think I started not even knowing what artificial intelligence was when I first started in artificial intelligence. And I think that that really speaks true to this idea that like women can be included in technology. And so these excuses of like, well, we can't find qualified women or, you know, we don't know where they are. Like they're all around you. It's just a matter of like making sure that your opportunities are, in, are, uh, are, are, presented in a way that makes them feel like they can belong at your company. And so I think it's going to be very important to include women, not just in the strategic uh, view of like them as consumers, because they are the, the, mo like the largest population segment in the world. But they also have a lot of financial power and you need to include them from the perspective of building because the products that you build will not resonate to women unless women are included in this process. But, but the most common question I get in this is when I go to my team and say, for example, we have 30%, we need to get this ratio up to 40%. If you get it up to 40%, I mean, it's not like a hard numeric target, but we've got to think in that direction. And they say, okay, 60% of the new recruits have to be women. Is There isn't enough supply. Yeah. That's, that's I don't the think big issue that I kind of that we constantly keep hearing about. So how do you address that that issue at all, or can it be for addressed me, at all? Yeah, I do, um, and I think that the answer to that is like transferability. I think uh, naturally, like there, this is a this is a data bias, by the way. Of course, there are less women in these roles because up until very recently, women weren't either allowed or encouraged to pursue these roles. So naturally. That's a, a data. And actually, you know, we criticize this about about AI all the time when we're saying like, OK, well, Google returns uh, mail for it, doctor because, you know, that's what it does and female for nurse. And everyone's like, oh, that's discriminatory. Of course it is, because it the way that's that Google boss. arrived at that decision yeah. was that it used historical data. And historically speaking, there was a point in time where met, women weren't allowed to be doctors or lawyers. And so what ends up happening is the data set that Google pulled that, that correlation from is biased itself. And so naturally right now we're in an inflection point where we're at the same place. Like historically speaking, women have not been in these careers for long. And so when we're sort of looking at supply, that bias is worked in. What ends up happening as a solution for me is like you start looking at transferability. You have a very good mathematician that's a woman, great, like teach her how to program. You have a very good designer, graphic designer or illustrator, great, teach her UX, UI. You have a very good communicator, awesome, teach her about SEO. So it's really understanding like where is the transferability of skill sets that women have historically been a part of and how are those skills immediately convertible into uh, the role that you wanna fill and the, the types of, of slots that you wanna fill. And so I think is the solution for me is transferability. And that's such a lovely insight. And I'm going to take that back to my company next time I get this argument inside. Uh, but, you know, I could talk to you. We've been speaking in two full episodes and I think we could do three or four more and perhaps we will. 
But <laughs> I am going to come to the final facet of your multifaceted uh, journey, which is you're an entrepreneur. You built a firm, and you know the challenges of starting for something, and you chose very interestingly, not just to be in social tech, which, if you might pardon my language, doesn't pay or isn't known to pay, <laughs> but at the same time you ended up bootstrapping the firm. So can yeah. you just tell us a little bit about how hard this has been, how easy it's been? And um, I'm going to ask you that question. I'm going to ask you one more and then maybe you'll come back for another episode. <laughs> sure thing. So um, I think that, that people definitely think social entrepreneurs shouldn't or can't make money. And I'm a very big fan of the opposite of that. Uh, I think that we need to be putting our best minds to social issues, which means that we need to be offering competitive pay. We need to be thinking about the viability and the profitability of like doing good. And we need to realign economic incentives and financial instruments that have traditionally been consumptive or extractive to the world. We need to be realigning them toward regeneration and social impact. So I think- I'm just going to interrupt you for one minute. Yes. You're only the second social entrepreneur I met who said that, and it's such an important- point that I want to emphasize it, right? Somebody asked this guy who came in, who was doing some great work, oh, you know, but why are people, why do you have to pay big salaries to the people who work with you? And the guy said, the guy is, a, the person's got a life. They have a dream. They want to live their yeah. own life. And why yeah. shouldn't they be earning this? Because they're doing good for the world. Yeah. Instead of somebody sitting in a bank or some tech firm and like doing whatever it is. Yes. So I'm so glad you made that point because mm -hmm. sometimes we think that the very word social work means I'm doing it pro bono, that I'm doing it for mm -hmm. gratis. And that's not true. If you want to attract the best planes, you've got to pay the best money. Correct. And we give unlimited vacation policy. We like, you know, we want it to be a, a healthy place to work. We want it to be a good place to work. And we want people that are like feeling good as they're doing good. And I think that that's super important. And it's, it just means that like, we need to think about the viability, the financial viability of doing good means that that project will live longer. Its impact will multiply. So we don't think about things like in, from a charitable approach. We think about it as like, what is the strategy for keeping this viable? What is the strategy for uh, making sure that we have our best talent on it? What is the strategy for making sure that we are competitive and that it's not just that you choose to go work with our firm because we're doing good. You're choosing to work with our firm because we're great tech technologists. We're excellent and very creative when it comes to designing solutions. And on top of that, hey, it feels good because it's also going to be an impactful solution, but it is going to solve your business problem. It's going to solve your government problem. It's going to solve the industry approach problem that you came to us for. And we're doing it in an innovative way. It just also happens to be a very, very impactful way. And I think that that's really the core of what we're doing. Um, now, when I first started, people didn't really get that. <laughs> um, they were like, <laughs> I was just going to say, why, why is impact so important? You know, I don't think that they predicted that impact would be as dominant a conversation as it is today, because in the pandemic, I think everybody realized that we can't keep ignoring the, the global social issues that we have. I think the pandemic showed people the degree of inaccessibility of health, the, the, you know, inequality of health outcomes and quality. They saw, you know, people struggling with poverty, even though they had jobs, they saw, you know, all of these social uh, and, and economic issues that came to the limelight that started impacting their main consumers, their employees, et cetera. And then companies started looking and saying, Ooh, okay. So we can't, we can't just keep operating as we have. How do we sort, how do we work through this? And so there was a change in my company's uh, demand when I guess companies started to see that they were inextricable. But when I first started, this was not the case. And so I started, uh, and, I, and at the time I had gotten a lot of my entrepreneurial ideas from North America. And I was kind of like stuck on this path of like, oh, well, I have to go get funding and uh, go down this VC path and so on and so forth. So the first year I kind of set out on that path and it was a horrible experience. Um, I was a young Latin American woman and I was very uncomfortable in many of the situations. There were flat out uh, just aggressions toward uh, toward me in in either verbally by saying things like, you know, I I don't know if I should help you or or uh, or what is it? Um, Missing you. Uh, yeah, I, like, know, kind of like I don't know if I should help you or yeah, like uh, if I should just help you. I think what you're doing is so 
great. And uh, I just like, I can't believe you're like this beautiful while you're doing it. Like your mouth, like comments on my, on my mouth. Like it was very, very, very uncomfortable. Um, I would get, um, I had a situation where like somebody told me that they didn't want to invest in me because they just wanted to take care of me personally. And they didn't want to create a conflict of interest that would ruin our ability to pursue a personal relationship when I had never, ever, ever indicated that I even wanted that with this person at all. And so it was a very difficult experience. There was a lot of discriminatory moments. There was a lot of just like moments that uh, maybe some of the comments were just like subtle enough that you wouldn't even, like you can't even make a huge deal out of it because it's subtle enough, but there were moments that are like very obvious and, and disgusting. And so I had the full range of, of experiences. God. So at one point after the the one, when he told me he wouldn't invest because he wanted to take care of me personally, after that moment, I was like, no, 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 no. Like I love, like I am very, very firm in what I believe I'm doing and I'm going to continue to do that, but I can't do it at my own expense. And so I decided to stop looking for funding and I decided to start looking um, for clients. And I said, okay, if I channel the same energy to find one client that pays me, that'll be enough. Um, And so at first it was hard because essentially we needed to we were a startup. We didn't have a track record. So people didn't, they didn't have any legacy to trust about what we had done before. And we were asking them to trust us with like significant, you know, resources in order to make these very complicated, almost naive sounding projects happen. Now they know they're not naive because we had to prove it, but at first they did sound that way. And so who do they trust? What do they trust? And so I built a, I re I like sat down and reworked my whole strategy. So my strategy was no more investment. We're going to go down the client path. And what are they going to trust? They're going to trust me. So I started writing. I started uh, doing uh, conferences and speaking engagements a lot. Um, And very slowly, like people started coming to my panels and listening to what I had to say. And then people would walk up to me and be like, I'm actually really interested in your perspective on this. And so I started doing like some strategic consulting, which would then lead to a project proposal, which would then lead to a project. Um, And then we gave uh, we gave away a lot of the early tech because we just I knew um, that there was no choice. So we sucked it up. uh, And and that's why I'm very grateful to the people that have been with Emerge from the beginning is because we we sacrificed a fair bit to get people to see that we could build technology that didn't just sound good, that it actually worked. Um, And at that point uh, in 2020, like the there was a big shift in, uh, okay. you know, we can't ignore the greater, you know, issues that the world is facing. Hey, Lucia, haven't you been doing this for a really long time? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, I have. And so that was at that point, it was a very different conversation. Uh, but I genuinely initially thought my company wouldn't make it past the pandemic. I think every entrepreneur goes through moments where it's like, either you're jumping up and down in joy, or you're like sitting on the hotel floor crying because you don't think it's going to work out. I did have a moment in the pandemic where I thought we weren't going to make it because a lot of our projects were paused because people didn't know what was going to happen. And so I called this friend of mine who works at the Inter-American Development Bank. And I said, I think, I don't think Emerge is going to make it. And so he called me the next day and he's like, don't worry, I have a job for you. You can lead uh, this like effort of, you know, a blockchain and AI related effort in, in uh, the bank or whatever. And I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. I don't need a job. I need my company to survive. So I need a project. And he's like, oh, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So then he, they called me back a week later and they're like, we might have a project for you. Um, and so that was the only reason why uh, why we made it through. But I think, uh, you know, there's a very interesting idea of what it means to be a bootstrapped entrepreneur. And in the recent years, it's started to become very glorified because a lot of white men started deciding that they wanted to do things on their own terms and now be a bootstrapped entrepreneur. But the reality is, if you look at the state of venture capital funding and seed capital funding around the world, actually, uh, the concept of a bootstrapped entrepreneur existed in a different space, in minority spaces, in women-led ventures that are completely underfunded. And I think that as you sort of think about what it means to be a bootstrapped founder, think about the people that didn't have a choice. You know, think about people that don't get funding because they're international or they have an accent and they can't pitch in the right way or because, you know, they they happen to be a woman and will go through these kinds of sexual experiences or uh, because, you know, they're just chronically underfunded and people uh, sort of assess them by their track history instead of their potential in the way that they do other uh, uh, like men. And so it's just a very interesting concept to, to now be referred to as a bootstrapped entrepreneur in celebration when in reality, it's a reflection of like, people that look like me or that have my similar background, it's been something that we've had to deal with. And so we are the ultimate bootstrapped entrepreneurs, but 
um, you know, in a way that speaks truly to the ways that technology as, a, as an industry and as a funded industry needs to change. Well, thank you so much for sharing that and so transparently because um, I think the first part really talked to me. It must have been really difficult to go through it. And it's heroic that you went through that and, and you know, struck out and said, I'm going to go and do it my own terms. And you've succeeded in that. Uh, I, my first startup was a bootstrap uh, version <laughs> my, myself, so I can understand some of the pain that you talked about. Yeah. not the other kinds of discrimination. Uh, but I, and I do believe that there is a inherent bias um, in the way people think about these things. And, you know, having also now in my second thought of raise money, I don't know whether yeah. it's good or bad. I think it's also a little bit about the fact that, um, you know, you, you, you have to, you know, both sides come with, I think both, both, both raising money and bootstrapping come with different advantages. But the truth is that I think uh, many people just simply don't have the opportunity simply because of the fact that they're not able to explain themselves in a language that speaks to the language of high finance. That is the biggest block. But um, Lucia, like I said, I could keep talking to you for another hour, but I have a last question for you. What advice would you give your younger self if you could go back in time? (laughs) Uh, I thought you said you only had one short question for me. (laughs) This is the shortest Um, question. (laughs) All right. I will try to answer it briefly, which is, um, I think I would tell myself to trust my gut more often, not to do things in the way that like they're supposed to be done. Um, I would be, I would just tell myself like, you know what you're building and you like, you're thinking about this strategically. You're not afraid of criticism. Um, and that means that like whatever it is that you process as criticism, you process as feedback, ultimately your gut's going to make the right decision because you have that right combination, which is if you can't take feedback, don't trust your gut because maybe it's wrong and it's biased. If, if you can take feedback, uh, you'll be an excellent entrepreneur when you learn how to listen to the feedback, analyze things strategically, holistically, and then trust your gut because your gut will make the right decision. So I think I would have told myself to start that sooner. Um, but, you know, I think at the same time, uh, I'm grateful for the journey that I've had. It's made me uh, a, a particular type of entrepreneur. And I think it, it is just making uh, each of my next, you know, moves uh, a lot stronger and coming from a, a foundation of, of confidence. And so, um, so in a way, I wish I would have started that sooner, but at the same time, and I would encourage other people to trust their gut, especially if they're uh, female entrepreneurs that constantly get, you know, a heavier degree of criticism or feedback. Um, there's something about what you envision um, that set you on this path and trusting and staying true to that is very, very important. We will never not be a humanitarian, uh, you know, socially impactful company that will never change. The technology that we use, the tech stack, the way we arrange it, the algorithms, the math, the everything else can change, but our DNA has remained the same for years. And I think that that's, um, that that consistency will just enable you to strategically uh, build you know, whatever it is that you want to build in a way that's true to its original DNA. And I think that that's, those are the most special entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lucia. But if I had to just quickly comment on that, the one thing that struck me throughout the entire conversation is, here is a lady who trusted the gut feel that she had at eight and <laughs> yes. at 12 and repeatedly through her life. So if you're coming back and telling me I should trust in my gut more, I don't know how to react to that. I just don't know. Interesting. But, I actually hadn't thought about it that way, to be honest. That's a very... Uh, that's I'm my take overwhelming that. takeaway. My overwhelming yeah, takeaway about that so many other things. Yeah, I'm going to have to say with that. Thank you. Anyway, uh, it's been great having you on the show. Uh, it's, you know, it's such a pleasure to listen to somebody who's um, kind of started so early and wanted to create social impact, went and did technology you know, is a woman, a social, you know, an entrepreneur, and, you know, you've combined all these different facets so well, but really the humanitarian, transparent, efficient movement of people, goods, and data. What a wonderful mission you've set yourself on. Thank you so much for sharing all of these thoughts on technology, on leadership uh, with this audience. And, um, you know, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly been a pleasure, and I hope we do it again soon. Uh, to my viewers and listeners, it's been great. Thank you for listening to Lucia and to me today. Slaves to the Algo is available on YouTube, Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your poison from. We release a new episode every week, sometimes a little bit more frequently. If you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Stay relevant because we are in the age of data and AI, and we do not want to be a slave to the algo 
as has been so wonderfully demonstrated to by a true, I really shouldn't say a master of the algo, but saying a mistress of the algo doesn't sound right. But she, Lucia clearly is not a slave to the algo. Thank you once again, Lucia, and see you all next week.